Our scripture reading this morning is found in uh, John chapter 13, verses 21 through 38. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was no, there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. Then he then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I give a sop when I have dipped. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Jesus had the bag, that Jesus had said to him, Buy those things which we had need of again for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Simon Peter, Peter said unto him, Lord, whither thou goest? Jesus answered him, Whither I go thou cannot follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice.
John chapter 13. As we approach today's passage, we are in the midst of one of the most intimate as well as moving moments in all of Jesus's ministry. If you remember, this is nighttime. They are having the supper together and they're meeting intimately together. And he's just finished all of his public ministry. And from now on, it's more intimate stuff that's going on, more teaching of the disciples, more of those things leading right into the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And so it's nearly half of the uh, book of John, the entire book of John, nearly half of it involves this one week, uh, this one week of him uh, coming together with his disciples and him going to the cross. And the scene unfolds in the upper room during the Last Supper, a setting rich with significance as Jesus prepares his disciples for the events that are about to happen. In the opening 20 verses of John chapter 13, Jesus sets the tone for the final evening with a powerful act of humility as well as service. And he washes the feet of his disciples, a task that is typically only done by the lowest servant in the house. So you remember I said last night, you have to put in context of where we're at, what's going on. This isn't just a meal at our place here in America. This is a meal back in that day, at that time, what was going on. For him to do what he did was unthinkable to any of his disciples. Yeah, first and all, just understand that. I mean, like, he is actually taking a towel, he's taking water, he's bending down on his knee, the creator of the universe, and he's washing their feet. He's doing the lowliest task for everybody that knows what's going on in culture. And so what he's doing, he's setting the tone. What's he saying? He's saying, if you're going to live and you're going to call yourself Christian, you're going to have to bow your knee, you're going to have to get your towel dirty, and you're going to have to self-sacrifice yourself for others, for other people. And so remember always in context, this is what's going on, and this is what they're listening to. And they aren't used to this at all. This is hitting home to them. And this is a very intimate message that he's giving them. And this act is not just a demonstration of physical cleanliness, but it's a profound lesson in spiritual humility as well as love. And Jesus, knowing that his hour had come and he'd soon depart from this world, he chose, he chose to model the kind of servant leadership that he expected from everyone else that would be followers of him. That includes you, and that includes me. So the message that he gave that day is strategically given to us even today in 2024. Following the Lord never changes because why? He is unchangeable. Why is he unchangeable? Because he is perfect. You don't change perfection because why? It doesn't need to be changed. It's perfect. And that's who we serve. And he further uh, explains the significance of his actions when he said these words. He said these words in verse 13 and following. You call me master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Here, Jesus emphasizes that his followers are to embody this same spirit of selfless service, loving one another as he loved them. However, this evening of profound teaching and this evening of example is shadowed by a dark reality, which begins to unfold right in front of them all. And they really didn't understand it at all. Despite the close fellowship that they shared, Jesus knows that one of his own, Judas Iscariot, will betray him. And so this passage transitions from the demonstration of sacrificial love to sadly the somber uh, prediction of defection, of departure, and of denial. And that's what we see in this passage as we delve into this uh, remainder of John 13, we move from the act of washing feet 
to the heart-wrenching predictions that will test the faith and loyalty of his disciples. And the same Jesus who just moments before knelt in humble service now speaks of the deep sorrow that will soon come to pass. This passage serves as a bridge between Jesus' final teachings and the suffering that he will endure, reminding us of the cost of discipleship and the depths of Christ's love, not only for his disciples then, but his love for us today. Jesus delivers three significant and troubling predictions, each deeply affecting his disciples and seeking the stage for events to come. So I want you to notice with me the warning by Jesus. The warning by Jesus. Number one, as you take notes, notice Judas's defection. Judas's defection, Jesus's departure, and Peter's denial. Okay, that's the three points. Judas's defection. Under Judas's defection, you'll see two things. First of all, you'll see the statement and you'll see the sign. But under this statement that Judas defects, the statement is this. First of all, prophetic yet troubled Jesus. Jesus was speaking prophetically, yet he was troubled. And get this, don't forget this. It is never ever a thrill for Jesus to have to follow through with a plan that we make and choose on our own. Let me say that again. It's never a thrill for Jesus to follow along and go along with the plan that we choose that is wrong and against his way. He's never thrilled about that. So I want you to see this throughout, that you have choices, I have choices. We're given choices, and the choices we make have consequences. They carry a whole host of consequences. So the choices that we make, we ought to make those choices what? In view of what he says. So when we make our choices in view of what he says, then what we choose ought to be the right thing. Because we're choosing something that goes along with what God commands and what God calls us to do. That make sense? Um, so as you look at this, prophetic, it troubled Jesus. The words which Jesus said were prophetic. However, they were troubling to him as well. Verse 21 says, when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. See, being human, Jesus was troubled over Judas's soon betrayal of his love and his friendship. And being divine, Jesus knew in advance that it would happen. Jesus sensed the spiritual hardness and deadness which sin had produced in Judas. And it can produce that in us as well before we receive Christ as our Savior. And it's sad to see. People that just say, hey, I am not going to be moved. And I don't care what you do. I don't care how much time I spend with you. I don't care how much time I spend. I will not be moved. And you say, well, that's, there's some courage in doing that. No, friend, it's stupidity when you're doing that against Christ. It makes absolutely no sense to say no to him. And so this is what Judas is doing right here. He had given Judas every opportunity to repent. He's given us every opportunity as well. You can never say, Lord, you've never been fair to me. He's been more than fair to you and me. More. If you live till next Sunday, you've given more opportunity than you ever and I ever deserve. He's totally fair. So he could postpone the inevitable no longer, and he had things to say to his own, things that he could not, would not say, so long as Judas and the evil and the treachery he stood for were present in the room. You see, the Lord now took deliberate steps to what? To expose Judas. To expose him. It's interesting to observe how greatly this final irrevocable and terrible action, it actually troubled Jesus. It hurt him. Because why? He had spent three years with Judas as well. He had done just the same thing as he'd done with all the disciples. And he knew. He knew what was going to go on. And it hurt his heart. 
And the second thing you see is perplexed disciples, not only prophetic, uh, yet troubled Jesus, but perplexed disciples. Jesus' announcement creates confusion and concern among the disciples. We're sitting here today and we're just like, my goodness, he said whoever he gives the sop to, they ought to have known right then what was wrong with these people. Weren't they paying attention? You got to get in context. It wasn't like he had a, a, a megaphone and saying, whoever I give the sop to, that's going to be the bad guy. Just look at Judas. He wasn't doing that. Do you do that at home when you eat? No, we, we were just with uh, 17 people. We ate every night with 17 people. I'm like, well, this is crazy. 17 people. I'm sitting down here, and I'm talking. I'm sitting down here, and I'm talking. And so we're talking together. 17 people down there, they have no idea what we're saying. In fact, we can just look down and say, look how goofy they look. You know, you just say whatever you want to say. They don't know what you're saying. This is what's going on. They're also not sitting at a table. They're reclining. Now, I think every house ought to have this, right? Just like a bunch of beanie bags all the way around. Just everybody just kind of laying down, you know, what's next here, you know, to eat. And so that's what they're doing. So they didn't know everything. Because when you read this passage, you're like, why didn't you know? Why didn't you know that? He said it plainly from his lips, or you're not paying attention. So he's exposing Judas, and he's being very careful how he exposes Judas. He's not mean about it at all. He could have just stood up and said, hey, this dude right here, he's getting ready to betray me. Get him. But he didn't. He gave Judas another opportunity. Judas had from the time that he was there to get right. But we'll see why he didn't do that. Because somebody else entered in and took over. And so pay attention to what's going on. They're certain of whom he speaks, highlighting their innocence and Judas' deception. And they were speechless. See, they said, then the disciples looked on to one another, doubting of whom he spake. They're confused of what's going on. They were speechless with horror at last. The truth dawned on them. They knew their own faults and they knew their own failures well enough. They knew that. They knew that, man, this could possibly be me because I know how bad I am. And so, but to be a traitor, to betray the beloved Lord to his foes, this seemed incredible. And they searched their own hearts and each other's faces. They looked around in bewilderment. And then next came Peter's inquiry. You know how Peter is. He's going to ask. But I want you to notice, Peter wasn't close enough to Jesus to ask. Do you get that? Now understand this. Sometimes we think, well, Peter was right there. If he wasn't on the right, he was on the left. No, he wasn't. He wasn't even close enough for Jesus to hear him. So what's he do? He looks at John. He looks at John so that John would do his bidding. Peter, eager to understand, motions to John to ask Jesus for more clarity. Look at verse 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. There's no other person that that would be other than John. And John, the writer of this gospel, never uses his name. That's the humility that John has. He didn't use his name. He just says, well, it's the one that Jesus loves. He doesn't put his name on J-O-H-N, big capital letters. It was me, 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 me. He doesn't do that at all. And what's it say? Simon Peter, therefore, beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of him. He spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast, saying to him, Lord, who is it? You see, the disciple whom Jesus loved was John, the author of this gospel. And John and Judas were reclining next to Jesus. Yeah. John on one hand, Judas is carried on the other. Now, I don't know exactly why this happened here, but I know that the stage was set that Judas would be what? One of the favored ones. You remember what we learned earlier? Who's holding the bag of the group? Who's the group treasurer? It's Judas Iscariot. It's like, I don't know about you, but when we get a group of people together, I don't look at the lowliest person and say, hey, let's give our money to them. 
I'm like, I, I want to make sure that I give my money to somebody that I, I probably trust and they're not going to rip us off. Right? So you have to understand, this is the way they thought. The disciples like, this is Judas Iscariot. He's the one who holds the money in the bag. He's got it all. He's on the left side of Jesus. Everyone's reclining there. They're eating their food. And so John is right there. Peter's looking down at John, and he's saying, hey, ask him the question. Go ahead and ask him. And so we see this. John and Judas were reclining, but Peter's position at the table was not near enough to ask Jesus privately. So he motioned to John and asked him to ask where, what Jesus meant. John, reclining next to Jesus, inquires directly, setting the stage for the revealing sign. So you see the statement. Now you see the sign. The sign. First of all, definitive indication. Definitive indication. Jesus identifies Judas as the betrayer by giving him a piece of bread. We'll explain this. Look at verse 26. Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. You say, well, we don't do that nowadays. Yeah, nowadays we don't do that. Nowadays we would give an honored guest a different mark of recognition. It would be more customary in our culture to propose a toast or to lift a glass in acknowledgement. And we do that. You've done that and you've seen that done. In Jesus' day, a choice morsel was dipped in the sauce by the host and presented to him to be the special one. And Jesus indicated to John that he would indicate the traitor in this way. And it is doubtful whether any of the other disciples heard the exchange. And I don't believe they did because it says in the verses we're going to get to that they didn't know. They had no idea. And so in they, they, since even after the sop was passed, they still seemed to not suspect Judas. I mean, like he was the last dude in the room that they would append this on. The very last one. And so for Jesus thus to single Judas out for this special honor would eliminate him from their minds. But how ironic it is that Jesus' act of friendship to Judas signaled Judas's betrayal of friendship. So secondly, you see demonic influence. Demonic influence. After receiving the bread, Satan enters Judas, solidifying his resolve. Look at verse 27. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. He's acknowledging the inevitable. See, the rejection of our Lord's final appeal, marking him for a gesture of special friendship and honor, so hardened the heart of Judas against Christ that it was now possible for Satan to move in and take full possession. See, up until this moment, Judas had been possessed by an evil intention, but he didn't have evil dwelling inside like he does now. And now he was possessed by the evil one, the genuine demonic influence. Next, you see departing deceiver. Departing deceiver. The disciples misinterpret Judas's departure, thinking he's running an errand. Because why? Because this has happened before. He's the one holding the bag. Surely Jesus before has told him, hey, go pay somebody to do something or get something. That was a common thing. So it wasn't anything to them. So they didn't know. Look at what it says. Verse 28. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. Does that make it definitive now? You understand? No man knew. No one knew. We can sit here and say, well, what? No one knew. No one knew. And for some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that he had need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. And man, was it night. When we see Judas leave the light of the upper room, the fellowship of the saints of God, and the presence of the Lord Jesus in the midst, we see him close literally the door. The darkness wraps around him. He makes his way down those stairs and he pauses to get his bearings and then goes his accursed way to the place where the enemies of Christ were awaiting him. 
He was now, as you remember in Scripture, he was now walking in the counsel of the ungodly. He was standing in the way of sinners. He was sitting in the seat of the scornful. That's exactly where he was. And henceforth, his name would be a universal synonym for treachery. Not too many kids named Judas today. Not too many ladies named Jezebel today. There's a reason. Because with those names comes a meaning and a history. And he would never know again in this life, nor in eternity, he would never know another moment of happiness. I mean, just think about this. Never again would he know happiness. Forever, he would know no happiness. It was definitely night for him, and from then on, it would be eternity for uh, be a night forever for Judas. And such was the background of the long heart-to-heart -heart talk the Lord now had to have with his disciples in the upper room. So first of all, you have Judas's, he, 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 he takes off, and then you have Jesus' departure. Jesus' departure. Two things under here, he must leave and they must love. He must leave and they must love. First of all, he must leave. He had to leave. First of all, you see glorious departure. Man, it was. Jesus speaks of his imminent glorification through his death, his resurrection and ascension, and he prepares his disciples for his physical absence, emphasizing the divine plan and purpose behind his departure. Verse 31 and 32 says, Therefore, when he was gone out... Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. You say, glorify, glorify, glorify. There's all the glory going on here. Yeah, because guess what? Satan himself left the building. When Satan's gone, there's a lot of glory to be got. Amen? When he's gone, he's out of the show. There's a lot of glory to be gotten. And all that glory belongs to who? To Christ. Him alone. And that's why we sing his praises. Before we know Jesus' glorious departure, we must touch on Judas's disgraceful departure. One can almost hear the Lord Jesus heave a sigh of relief when Judas really closed the door behind him. We need to note the expression, he was gone out. It underlines the voluntary act of Judas. He was gone out. Don't miss this. It is true that Jesus excommunicated Judas. He did. But it is equally true that Judas excommunicated himself. And don't ever forget this. In the last analysis, God does not send people to hell we send ourselves if we go there. We have to understand this. God endorses the choices they themselves make. And the departure of Judas heralded the departure of Jesus. He was on his way home, and the road was dark and steep. The cross stood across the way, but death and the tomb were to be conquered. Sin and Satan were vanquished. Already the Son of Man was glorified, and God was glorified by the sinless humanity of of Jesus Christ. Jesus was now on his way back to the glory he had with the Father. Before the world began, the glory that he laid aside when he came to earth, God was glorified in the Son of Man. The Son of Man was to be glorified as he trod that path of obedience, that path of obedience which led to Gethsemane. It's less to the, left to the hall of Gabbatha and to Golgotha and the grave right back to where? Right back to glory. There to be seated on the throne of God. And what a glorious departure it was. And next you see the gentle disclosure. The gentle disclosure. Jesus addressed them as little children. 
I mean, we've been hanging out for three years here, and you call us little children? Yeah. Because you really need to see the importance of the moment. You see, he says in verse 33, little children, yet a little while I'm with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you. He explains that they cannot follow him immediately, and he's preparing them for his absence. And he does it in a gentle way. He does it in a manly way. He does it in the right way. So you see, they, he must leave, but they must love. They must love. And here, where it gets to where like, well, this, everybody knows this. No, this isn't common knowledge. They must love. First of all, the new commandment. Jesus commands his disciples to love one another as he loved them. As he loved them. If you and I can take that in and really grasp what he's saying, our life would be totally revolutionized. There'd be no doubt about it. Your attitude, the way you see things, the way that we respond to things would be totally different. If we understood this concept. Verse 34 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. You see, this new commandment sets the standard of selfless, sacrificial love that should characterize all of Jesus' followers. The 11 disciples would survive in his absence by obeying his example of love. And the commandment is new in that it is a special love for other believers based on the sacrificial love of Jesus. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. I mean, what did he just do? He just got on the ground. He is the creator of the universe. He just got on the ground and washed their feet. He's saying, just as I have done to you, you ought to do for one another. And we said this, if you remember last week we, uh, or the week before last, we said this, washing someone's feet was being sacrificial and giving to them. It meant a whole host of things, not just washing your grubby toes. Toe jam and all, it took a lot of other things. A lot of other things. He included a whole bunch of things. And so we must understand that. He said, just if I loved you, that's the way you ought to love one another. Christians' love and support for one another enable them to survive in a hostile, non-God world. We have to love one another. Because why? When we go out, it's war. And you're not going to run into a bunch of people that love each other. You're going to be about run into a bunch of people that say, hey, we might not love one another, but we know who we hate, and that's him. And you see this all the time, friend. You come to our gatherings, you pray in any other name except that name Jesus. Don't you dare pray in his name. But you can come, you can pray, you can give praises, you can do whatever you want, but don't you name Jesus Christ. Whenever I get an invitation, and I get them often, I say, I'm sorry, but I have to decline. Because he is the preeminent one. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And if you're not going to include his name in a prayer, you might as well blow wind. Because it's useless. He's the one. And so that's it. We have to understand that. And so he's making it very clear is Jesus was the embodiment of God's love, so now each disciple should embody that same love. This love is assigned to the world as well as to every other believer. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life. Why? Because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. In other words, if you don't love the brethren, you might as well mark it up. You are not born again. 
Boy, that's pretty direct, isn't it? You hate the brethren, you're not saved. Don't care what you say and how you feel. You'll make it known that what? I love the brethren. Watch this. This is why it's hard that some people who says, I'm born again and I love Jesus Christ, but I never go to church. Who shows up at the church? The brethren. Who are you supposed to love? You can't get around that, friend. It doesn't make a difference what excuse you have. They're useless. It won't hold water. It gets real quiet. Because we live in a culture that is anti-brethren. Sure not going to go to a place where some brother is going to work on the car. Sure not going to deal any business with some brother. Those people are the most wicked people in the world. And you say, but I've experienced that. I'm sorry you've experienced that. But do you believe that in every brother? Well, I guess I probably have had that influence the way I you see who influenced Judas? He influenced him so much that Judas just allowed him to come in. If you're not careful, friend, your influence will allow him just to come right in. If you are not saved. Oh, by the way, if you are saved and you're in that category, you're not happy. I don't have to come to your house. I don't have to have a conversation with you. You are not happy because why because you're not doing what is right if you love me keep my commandments a new commandment i give to you love your brother and as i have loved them jesus said he loves us he's kind he's gracious if we're going to be like him we have to do the same Secondly, not only a new command, but also noble identification. Noble identification. With tenderness, Jesus tells his disciples they cannot follow him now, but assures them of their future reunion. This statement underscores the necessity of his sacrificial mission and the subsequent empowerment of the disciples. Look at verse 35. By this shall all know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. You see, friend, the world will recognize them as Jesus' disciples by their love for one another. This love serves as a testimony to their connection with Christ. That's our noble identification. That's what brings us together. Oh, we love it when we have Celebrating You. Next week, by the way, is Celebrating You. That'll be at Pastor uh, Matt and Joanna's house. Celebrating You. When we celebrate you, we come together, and people, most people don't know everybody. They don't know, but you know what brings us together? He does. He does. Because some of y'all say, man, I ain't going with those old people. Some of you old people say, I ain't going with those young people. I ain't going with these weird people. We all come together. You know what brings us together? It's Jesus Christ. And we come together and we go around the room and we share with one another. And then we, well, this is crazy. We pray out loud for everybody's request. And everybody knows what's going on in each other's so everybody in that month kind of knows, well, I know what's going on with her. I know what's going on with him. And they can be praying throughout the year. It's a sweet time of fellowship. Which if we're not careful, it's missed. I mean, when you get together, it's just not to get together and talk about politics and who you like and who you don't like and how the corn's growing. Talk about the Lord. What's he doing in your life? If he is doing anything, you'll talk about it. You can pretty much gauge the meter on, boy, they don't talk about Christ at all. Well, he's probably not doing anything in our life. Because we happen to talk about things that we like and things that are going on in our life, and it just kind of flows out. 
So if that's not something that's flowing out, it's not something that's going in. Because what goes in comes out. Don't you love silence in a church? It's a wonderful thing. You know, you could have this same kind of silence in your car by turning off the radio. Somebody say, you haven't been in my car, man, that thing's loud. It's true. To allow the Lord to speak to you about thir- certain things in your life and to have a conversation with him about it. I don't know why you're, I don't know why you're getting on me about that, but well, you were right. I was a knucklehead when I came to that situation. I'm sorry. And many times you'll look at me and say, well, don't tell me you're sorry. Go tell them you're sorry. And boy, that really gets bad then, right? Uh, yeah, you're right. I'm driving home. i got to tell her I'm sorry when I get there. So we can have a good evening. There's a lot of things that you can do prepping yourself to meeting other people on your way there. The most important thing you can do is pray. God, help me to stay out of your way and allow you to do what you want to do in this conversation. You work business, you're meeting clients. God, help me to get out of the way and let you do what you want to do so it'll be profitable for everybody. I have something that I think that would be smart, but you know what? If it isn't, shut my mouth and allow you to do what you want to do. And if you're in business, you own your own business, you don't do that, shame on you. You say, well, I am productive. You'd be more productive if you did that. I don't care what your bottom line says. Trust me. He's great. And he wants to hear what's going on. And so he's going to depart them. They know that. They've been hanging out with him for three years. And what do they want? They don't want him to part. They don't want him to leave. Why don't you stay here? We don't want you to leave. We thought you were going to just take over. Well, well, don't go. We don't want you to leave. But he's preparing them, getting them ready. And he says, hey, I must leave, but you must love. And I'm not going to leave you alone. And he'll get to that. Thirdly, you see this, and this is the sad part. Peter's denials. Peter's denials. First thing you'll see is Peter's confusion. His confusion. Peter, eager to follow, misunderstands the nature as well as the timing of Jesus' departure. And you know how it goes. It's just like us. We just jump in there and say, oh, wait, wait a minute. Let me get this right for you. Let me be the leader, Jesus. Here he goes. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, whither I go, thou cannot not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Whoa. Peter's out there on a limb, isn't he? I'll lay my life down for you. Peter's commitment was a carnal, fleshly commitment. It was caused by not knowing himself, his own personal weaknesses, or the weaknesses of his own human flesh. Peter's self-image was strong. He saw himself as being above serious sin and failure. He was well above that. He knew that. He could see that. He asserted with all the confidence in the world that he would die for Jesus before denying him. And this should be a very, very sincere warning to all of us. If Peter, who knew Jesus intimately and loved him, courageously would deny him, what is it going to do? to us, and how are we going to respond? How are we not going to deny him? He boldly declares his willingness to lay down his life for Jesus. Had he heard that? Yeah, you remember? We went over that in John chapter 10, verse 11. When Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Peter says, I'm going to give my life for you. So you have Peter's confusion. Well, notice John may well be indulging here in some irony. And he does. Peter affirms his readiness to to, to die for Jesus, and the exact opposite is true. 
We see this in at least two ways. In the first place, Peter was not really ready as the sequel will show. I mean, he didn't follow through with what he said. I am going to lay my life down for you. Jesus who? I, I don't know him. I haven't seen him. I, I don't know who he is. Who are you talking about? And the second thing, Jesus was about to lay down his life for Peter. So you see that irony that John puts here so that you grasp this is what's going on. Peter's confusion, but also Jesus' sobering comeback. This is sweet. His sobering comeback. Jesus gently rebukes Peter's overconfidence, predicting his denial. Look at verse 38. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. That night, for all of his bold words, Peter would plumb to the depths of cowardice. He would go to the bottom. And there is no blame in the Lord's words at all. He had nothing but appreciation for Peter's good intent. But he knew better than to count on it. And so, as he warned Judas, now he had to warn Peter. And Peter failed not once, but three times. And all three failures were on the same night with Jesus right off to his side. How do we know that? Luke 22 says these words, And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. The word wept bitterly, it's a word that, when you say it in the Hebrew, it's actually you can hear it. And it acts, and it sounds like it's bitter. It sounds like it's just so sorrowful for what it had done. The prediction must have come to a shock to Peter. It evidently quite subdued him, and this may be the reason that he remained silent throughout the rest of the time in the upper room. Though the other peers, uh, the others apparently spoke free, freely. You know, we don't hear again from Peter until chapter 18. Five chapters, Peter's not mentioned. Yikes. What's going on, Pete? Because he's the first one to throw something out there, right? But you know, we don't hear from him. You know, the next time that we hear from Peter is in chapter 18, verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Think about that. The last time he spoke, Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times. He didn't speak again, but this time when he speaks, he pulls a sword out and he cuts someone's ear off. And Jesus just is like, time again with Peter. I'm so like Peter. I know you're not. I am. And Peter, would you knock it off? You don't need to do that. Don't you think I'd call angels down right now and just take care of all this mess? Don't do that. Put your sword up. What are you doing? Come over here, Malchus. <laughs> Malchus sitting there with his ear cut off, is bleeding, going down. He just puts it back on his ear. To me, if I was Malchus... Man, I don't know who you are, but I believe you are who you say you are. Because no one's cut my ear off and come by and just put it right back on. And I mean, he's sitting there going, he goes, there's no blood there. There's none. He's a soldier, by the way. He knows what cutting your ear off is all about. He severed many years before. But there's no blood. What do you think is interesting? Jesus puts his ear back on. And you'd think in Scripture we'd see later on down the road, Malchus turned his life around because Jesus healed his ear. We never do know, do we? I just put you in that seat. Are you like Malchus? Because we never hear of Malchus getting in front of any of the people and saying, wait a minute, 
don't kill this guy. He's a really nice guy. Let me show you. You never hear that. You would think he would be the first to say, hey, put the brakes on, folks. We don't want to be doing this. He healed me. No one's ever done that. But you don't hear that. How about you? Where are you at now? Are you like Malchus? Quiet? And God's worked in your life in many ways. And you've never said, hey, thanks, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing. And he's brought you through some horrendous things whether it be in a family, whether it be in a relationship, whether it be financially, whether it be in a business, whether it be in a job, situation in a neighborhood. He continues to show up. He continues to be there. He continues to reach out. If you reached out to him and said, thank you for being there. Thank you for not leaving me alone. Thank you for continuing to speak to my heart. Thanks for not being silent to me. God, you're wonderful. And I'm sorry, I've been a total idiot not talking to you. Forgive me. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. He gives us warning after warning and always tells us the truth. And then when he comes, we ought not be shocked. He tells us what to do and how to do it. And if we continue to choose to go against him, Just like he told Judas, what you have to do, go do quickly. You've made your choice. I've given you every opportunity. I'm sorry. What you have to do, go ahead and do it quickly. I encourage you. Listen to what Jesus has to say and respond to him. There'll be many distractions that'll come your way. Living proof just happened to you. You can either follow the distraction or you can say yes to him and say there's nothing getting in my way of number one, knowing you but number two, being right with you.